good morning. And uh, well, good morning anyway to our friends in the West. Uh, good afternoon to those who are tuning in uh, Midwest and otherwise. So good morning to our, to our supreme vaqueros of the Plains or the West. And uh, welcome to our, the first in our series. It's a spring series, uh, even though it's snowing outside here in Chicago. But we're calling this series, um, and it's gonna be actually more than spring. It's gonna be uh, connected to something larger uh, and already is. Uh, anyway, this is the first in our conversations on the Catholic Imagination series. And today's event is called A Canticle for Leibowitz and the Monastic Figure in a Dystopian World, featuring our guest speakers, Father Stephen Gregg and Katie Carl. My name is Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And I'm coming to you live from one of our many Loyola outposts through the wonders of digital technology. Uh, and on behalf of university leadership and on behalf of Dappled Things, a quarterly journal of ideas, art and faith who are co-sponsoring this event, I extend a hearty greeting to you. A kind welcome also from our dedicated center staff, our center manager, Megan Toomey, and our graduate student assistant, Kathleen McNutt. Megan and Kathleen are most instrumental in getting our events from farm to table, and I'm grateful for their su superb work. So thanks, Megan and Kathleen. Uh, these uh, conversations are organized with compelling topics in mind, to be sure, you know. Uh, and today's offering gets us started in both high substance and high style. But we also set these discussions with an eye on a larger community. And that's the community of the Biennial Conference on the Catholic Imagination, a most robust group of artists, scholars, readers, viewers who meet every other year to form a polis of shared passion, prayer, interest, and insight. The first of these conferences was at USC uh, in 2015. The next, the second one was at Fordham in 2017. And the last was here at Loyola in 2019 with well over 600 people in attendance. Uh, this conference is growing every year and you wanna give it a good look. Uh, and you can check our webpage about all the proceedings and speakers, there's so much there. With any luck and with a whole lot of grace, uh, we, we will be at Regis uh, University in the empire of Denver <laughs> for number four in the spring of 2022. We hope to see you there. Um, just some housekeeping before we begin our, our event. First is to put eyes on our next events. Uh, and you saw that on the slide. And thanks, Kathleen, for putting that together. But February 2nd is the first in our spring series, Catholic Higher Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought, based on a forthcoming edited volume by our first guest, Bernard Prusak of King's College and Jennifer Reed Booley of uh, College of St. Mary. They will be presenting on their essay, uh, A System Adrift, Catholic Social Thought as an Anchor for Catholic Higher Education. And this will open up nicely for needed dialogue. So do join us uh, and please check our website for further information about that event in the series. The other event for you to circle on your calendar uh, is on March 11th for the second in this series, Conversations on the Catholic Imagination. It will be uh, the night of two fills. National Book Award winner Phil Cly and multiple award winning poet, SAS Moore, Philip Metris. Our topic, war, peace, and the Catholic imagination. Both Phil's are members of our Biennial Catholic Imagination Conference and have given great presentations. The same is true for our speakers today, Father Stephen Gregg and Katie Carl. So just one quick note on format and we will get going. Uh, today's Zoomcast is classified as a meeting, so we're all pros at Zoom by now, so we know what that means. Uh, we have certain things clamped down, uh, namely the chat, the interpersonal chat between participants. Uh, but we are using chat for questions and comments, so please direct your questions or comments to me. You'll see my name in that uh, chat box, Michael Murphy. Ask your question, make a comment, and I encourage you to do this as we go so I can kind of start building out a list as you hear Father Stephen, Father Greg make a point or two that you uh, want to comment on or ask about or Katie's response, just throw them in there and, and I'll log them. So uh, uh, write it down and submit it and we'll go from there and I will integrate as, as best I can. Uh, so then let's welcome our speakers. Stephen A. Greg is a monk of the Cistercian Abbey of Our Lady of Dallas in Texas. After undergraduate studies in classics and in medieval studies at the University of the South, Swanee, 
he entered the Cistercian Monastery in 2006. Father Greg completed a licentiate in patristics, uh, patristic theology, I should say, at the Patristic Institute Augustinianum in Rome, and is now a doctoral candidate in the Institute of Philo Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas. At the University of Dallas and the Cistercian Prepar Preparatory School, excuse me, he has taught courses in English literature, grammar, music, Latin, philosophy, and theology. So welcome, Father Greg. Now, Katie Carl is the author of As Earth Without Water, a novel scheduled for release from Wise Blood Books in August 2021. She's the editor-in-chief of Dappled Things, a magazine of ideas, art, and Catholic faith. Katie's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the National Catholic Register, St. Louis Magazine, Evangelization and Culture, Genealogies of Modernity, Belombe, and Presence, a journal of Catholic poetry, as well as in Wise Blood Books re-release of Andrew McNabb's The Body of This and Ignatius Press's critical edition of Mansfield Park, among other publications. Those are at the end there. All this is great, Katie. I, I, just, I don't want to forget, but I love Mansfield Park and I love that McNabb book. So people tune in. Uh, Father Greg will begin, uh, and the title of this of this program is of his making. So, without further ado, a, a canticle for Leibowitz and the monastic figure in a dystopian world. Welcome, Father Greg. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. I'm glad to be here um, on a what's a beautiful sunny day in Texas, uh, and 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 still peaceful. A chance to talk about uh, future catastrophes <laughs> uh, in fiction, hopefully only. I, I did mention, uh, I, I want to warn people, since I am inside the monastery right now, uh, in a few minutes, a, a bell will go off in my room. I have no way of, of controlling it. Uh, it will be the indicator that it's time to go to midday prayer. Uh, but lest, lest you be worried, uh, I do have dispensation today to miss midday prayer uh, so that I can actually be here. Um, so, uh, that shouldn't, hopefully won't terrify you. So plenty of, of novels and films and uh, video games even, right? Offer images of a dark dystopian future. It's become a predominant medium really, it seems. Or at least they, they show us some kind of post-apocalyptic confusion. This usually means like strange government forms, uh, maybe tribalism or hyper technological government or some kind of alternative history, right? The what if category um, or weird new organizations, wasted landscapes tends to be important. Uh, zombie viruses, I guess just plain old viruses we're getting kind of used to as quasi apocalyptic. There's all kinds of imaginative tools that uh, writers use to try to say something about our own potential, right? About the actual day that, that we are in. And the Catholic imagination has never really been, uh, has never really been shy, it seems to me. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's eager to engage with even things that are comic to the point of bawdiness or terrifying to the point of horror um, as when, uh, I have the, the, the blessing to teach Dante's, oh, well, there's the bell, sorry. <laughs> it's almost done. It'll ring again in, in five minutes, <laughs> the, the mystery of monastic life. So I teach Dante's divine comedy and there are various points in the Inferno when Virgil, the guide of Dante explains in di to different people, I want to show him all of hell we can't miss a single piece. So it's important for the Catholic imagination and has been for its heritage to understand the troubles that we really face, not to delude ourselves. So there are many different ways that this is going on in, in culture today. What makes Walter Miller's novel, A Canticle for Leibowitz, so unusual, maybe not entirely unique, but, but pretty close and, and so interesting is that he chooses to build his story around a fictional monastery and a monastic order as it passes through a solid millennium of history from the 26th to the 38th century. And with 
descriptions even of its origins half a millennium before that in the 20th century, and all in just a few hundred pages. So I'm no editor, but to me, that sounds like an unlikely proposal for successful fiction. But, but the insight that Miller had is perhaps this. Though monasteries may, from one point of view, be the dullest, most retrograde, most unsurprising places day by day, so the least inventive by pattern, they're also mysterious and become weirdly interesting over the very long run. So at the root of the novel is I think a very monastic insight into the nature of life and, and what human hope would look like and the invariably strange ways that mankind keeps going on, somehow finding consolation in that grotesque weirdness. Now, Walter Miller himself seems to have pulled the inspiration from, for the story from, this is like part of the hagiography of this novel, everyone mentions this, from his own traumatic wartime experiences. Not even 20 years old when Pearl Harbor was attacked, he enlisted and became a radio man and tail gunner on US bombers, giving him, as it were, a good view of what was being bombed, right? On countless missions over Italy, as the Germans tried to maintain their hold on it at the end of the war. He served then, so the sort of initial moment, right, of this novel somehow, he served on one of the many bombers that dropped more than a thousand tons of explosives on Monte Cassino between Rome and Naples, the monastery founded by Saint Benedict himself in the sixth century, which they thought was being used as a, as a sort of a scouting outpost and, and, and artillery sort of ammunition dump. Turned out it was just holding a bunch of panicking civilians at the moment. But it's a monastery that in some ways is, is like a mountain fortress and always has been, but which at the same time, through the course of history, had gathered together vast numbers of manuscripts, much of the classical tradition in Latin preserved in manuscripts at this monastery, not just Christian works, right? So it had been a beacon of culture for a millennium and a half until he was able to watch it being bombed in what turned out to be a kind of a fiasco of an operation, not practically very successful and certainly didn't look good on, on you know, for PR. That seems to have guided Miller's thoughts, although he didn't seem to notice that till he was already working on the third part of the novel, he told a friend later. So, uh, although he, he wrote the first parts of A Canticle of Leibowitz little more than a decade later as a by then sort of Cold War era nuclear apocalypse novel, that deterrent policy of mutually assured destruction of like uh, if we raise the stakes high enough, maybe no one will play the game, right? Although that's the, at the, the atmosphere in which he writes the novel, he's actually thinking, he keeps the, the nuclear insanity really at the edge of the story in many ways, right? It's mostly the past and the future is, is this nuclear apocalypse. And he focuses on the monastery in the middle, sort of a bold choice, on the place of long inherited culture that is threatened by a new barbarism. So the novel is more a reflection on seeing that actual ruined monastery than just on a common than just being a commentary on nuclear strategy. And that, that's, I think, is why the story is so interesting. Not that nuclear apocalypse is not still possible, right? So to be honest, we, we've not really exited from that fear. I guess we've just sort of gotten used to it. So we don't have to reach far to get into the novel, but, but our interest in the novel's situation is heightened by our sense that the typical dystopias of, I don't know, totalitarianism, post-apocalyptic tribal rebuilding, technological dehumanization, viral disaster, or like ecological tipping points sort of in our control, but we, in the story, it's always too late for us to fix, you know? These are rooted in vast human problems, not something very specific. 
that's midday prayer starting. So <laughs> that's good. T today, as a brief tangent, is the celebration of the, the solemnity of the founders of the Cistercian order. So the Cistercian monks are here praying right now for that. And, and, and curiously, when Leibowitz of the novel survives nuclear holocaust and wants to learn how to start a monastery it's to the cistercians that he goes so we have hope to survive nuclear war even that's what we're we're not praying just for that though anyway i was saying so the the novel's question right i don't think we should think of it as just what would post nuclear apocalypse life be like a scenario we like to think is unlikely but but rather how do we get into a dark age? What is its nature? Are, are, are we even already in a dark age? How do we survive one with a sense of true human dignity and purpose? What would it look like to come up with a way of surviving in such a world? And of course, what is the relationship between the progress of civilization and its self-destruction? Is that, is that a necessary end of society or is there more going on? You know, we can talk about that more, but I can't help adding now that Miller understands the Dark Age as a time when the monks gather countless scraps of information that they cannot understand in the hope that one day an integrator, he's called, will come to reveal the patterns within it to fit things together again. Now, we live in, we're, we're told it's an information age, right? There is virtually infinite scraps of, of data and content available, but does it fit together into a co coherent whole? Do, do we feel like it's all integrated? Do we know which things are going to be important, which things we need to preserve and which, which aren't? Maybe you know, we have been rendered foolish, not by the deprivation of post-nuclear war, but like foolish by our abundance. There's infinite stuff. So the novel, in a way, I, I feel like it, it enters right in where we can, in a sense, feel ourselves present without yet having lived in a nuclear wasteland. Anyway, to, to the novel specifically. So the, the novel has three parts, which were actually first published separately in a magazine, uh, the book that I think in 1959. So first we have Fiat Homo. Each one carries a Latin subtitle. So let there be man or let there be a man or the man, which takes place in a non-scientific, barbarously uncivilized era when the monastery has its relics, which they call the memorabilia, the, the things to be remembered that can be remembered, but they can't piece them together. They can't quite understand them. And the main event there involves the canonization of blessed Isaac Edward Leibowitz after a certain long-term novice named Brother Francis Gerard of Utah of a pagan tribe in Utah, <laughs> discovers an ancient fallout shelter and manages to preserve a blueprint of an electric dynamo, though without understanding it at all. The second part, called Fiat Lux, the words from Genesis, let there be light, skips ahead half a millennium, a point that loses a lot of readers, I think, <laughs> skips to a kind of renaissance when there's governments and kingdoms and there is a renewal of secular science in mathematics. And the main event here is when one of these secular scholars finally makes a visit to the monastery to inspect what they have preserved. And it turns out one of the monks has reinvented electric lighting, or let there be light. And then the third part called Fiat Voluntas Tua, right? Thy will be done. This passes on another half millennium to a highly advanced now sort of reinvented culture, traveling in space, colonizing distant stars that has of course reinvented nuclear weapons. The main event, the advent of another nuclear apocalypse, the destruction of the Abbey, but the escape of a group of bishops, priests and monks on a spaceship to take the memorabilia to the Alpha Centauri colony and preserve the church's tradition, even if earth is totally annihilated. There's a lot of other things that go on, but these are the key strands. And I think what, what Miller does to draw them together, and he includes a lot of, of key words and images that link the story. Um, and he is good at like drawing details on the side without explaining them. Like 
it's interesting to us who live in North Texas, like Texarkana becomes the center of a dominant empire. Um, I've been through Texarkana many times and it still excites me to think about this, you know, or, and its opponents are the empire of Denver and Laredo. And oh, it's, it's, uh, he's good at, at, at introducing these, but then he, he, we never really go there. Um, he could have written many, many, much more in detail, but he focuses on that monastery in the middle. So there's a lot of weird bits that are in there. And each part though has its, its carefully chosen set of key players in the monastery. So the first part has an abbot Arcos. It has this novice, Francis Jared, who discovers these relics. And it's got the investigators from New Rome. Rome has been obliterated, so New Rome. They come to, 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 to look at the cause of canonization. Then the second part has a new abbot named Paolo of Pecos. And we have a bickering duo of monks, right? The librarian, sort of old fashioned, and the inventor monk, who, who is obviously, you know, he's the one who wants to move the crucifix to put the light bulbs up, right? Uh, and then we have a visiting secular scientist, Thon Tadeo. And then the third part, again, a new abbot, Abbot Zerki. So we have Abbot Arcos A in the first part and Abbot Zerki Z in the last part, sort of the whole history, right? A to Z. And we have a brother, Joshua, who will lead the monks into space, and then another outsider, Dr. Kors, who is a, which is like the word for heart, right, who is a relief doctor and a mercy killer, who is there to, to cure whom he can cure and euthanize whom he can't cure from the nuclear fallout. So these characters, there's a lot of interesting moments with them, but what I think is sort of the monastic character of the novel is, is a sort of a broader vision he makes with these three parts, right? He is not working with character as much as with that institution itself, its history, right? That's the character that we are examining. So the way I look at it is, is this, like what guides Miller's thoughts, I think is the interplay of, for anyone who studies medieval history, what are pretty familiar tropes of, mis, of monastic historiography. That on the one hand, Monasteries pres preserved ancient culture and thus made way for the rebirth of the Renaissance, that they did so in a space that is separated from society, and that's how they survive, by, by not being involved, <laughs> but is itself a kind of small society, not an individual, that belongs to the church but isn't identified with the hierarchical church. And then on the other hand, the familiar trope that monastic life preserved knowledge precisely by means of not understanding, right? By not being scientific, by a kind of blind allegiance to preserving in static form what later ages would think really needs to become effective and productive. So what Miller does is recreate this kind of fun dynamic rather carefully, not in, in the medieval past, but in a post-apocalyptic future, and use it to reveal, in his own kind of apocalyptic way, to really reveal something, to reveal something about human nature and human qualities, the mysteries that shine out against the darkness of human self-destruction. So Miller's use of this monastic conservation of knowledge without understanding is the source of a lot of fun in the book. He creates scenes in which we, the readers, understand what something is, but the monks completely misinterpret it. And it's, it's comic, especially in part one when there's not a lot of civilization. So for example, when Brother Francis finds relics of the past in a fallout shelter, he finds what looks like a grocery list from Leibowitz. It says, one pound pastrami, can kraut, six bagels. Words of sort of cliche meaning for us that he's going to a, to a, like a, to a Jewish deli, right? He's named Leibowitz. But for the monks, they have no idea what they mean. Like, what is pastrami? What is a bagel? They think this could be very important. It's sort of like if you imagine a church today, for all I know, there is one somewhere that, that claims as a relic like a list that St. Joseph made, you know, or like Mary made for Joseph when he was going to the grocery store in Nazareth. 
So we can sort of laugh at it, but he takes it very seriously. Or again, Francis finds electrical components like transistors. When he does that, we hear that the monastery has some of different shapes and colors in their museum, but they have no idea what they do. They, they know that they must mean something, <laughs> but they don't know what. And furthermore, the neo-pagan hill people around, this is a, it's a great weird detail, the, these pagans around will actually wear necklaces made of electronic components. They'll have their shamans eat transistors because their ultimate wise god is named Machina Analytica, which is Latin for computer. So they worship a god named computer without knowing what a computer is. So they're completely foolish. On the other hand, they're actually preserving a connection. These are parts of a computer. They just don't know what a computer is, right? And of course, you know, the, the greatest example of this in part one is when Brother Francis finds the this a circuit diagram blueprint, right? I remember looking at blueprints as a kid and thinking they looked really cool, but of course having no idea what they, they mean. And that's the same experience, right? This is something that St. Leibowitz himself has designed, and out of devotion, Francis decides to make an illuminated copy of it. It's sort of a, a joke about monastic art in a way, right? He has no idea what the lines or squiggles actually mean, but he can see that they signify something. They have beautiful interrelationship of parts. The monks don't even realize that the blue background is irrelevant. So they reproduce the dark background, wasting a lot of ink. And poor brother Francis dedicates years of his life to producing a beautiful version of it, something he, he can't understand out of the hope that the patron will be canonized and someone someday will tell me what this means or not me, it will bear fruit later. There's a kind of faith, right? So you see how, how Miller invites us to like a double cynicism potentially. So there's an obvious one, first of all, that like science, like that diagram that Francis preserves ends up allowing mankind to reinvent nuclear weapons and redestroy itself. <laughs> so science and worldly politics lead to repeated mass destruction, right? This enlightenment hope in progress towards an earthly paradise, the novel just shows as foolish. That's one potential cynicism. But there's another, right? This ironic view of the monks who misinterpret what they preserve tempts us to look down on them as well, as to see their religious dedication as basically blind superstition, as sort of a enlightenment trope about monks would have it. He tempts us to do that. He even makes it, I think he makes it easy for people by the very like pre-Vatican II style of monastic authority where the abbot is lord and ruler and there's a lot of Latin expressions that he doesn't quite translate. So there's this double cynicism, but I think that, that that's a temptation which is, means it's wrong, <laughs> right? That is leading us down the wrong path. That's not really the final reading. Miller wants us to focus not on the monk's understanding or lack of it or their unwitting usefulness for human progress, but on their, their weird kind of wisdom and fidelity. But this is why the monastic figure is central to this dystopia. Focusing on the monk here, means looking at the life of faith, not in its mystical aspects, or as a matter of profound individual faith, very hard to explain. The nice thing about monastic life is it just makes the life of faith sort of overly objective and visual. It turns it to fidelity, right? Practical fidelity, the observance of norms of practice, a lot easier to write about than individual characters' lives of faith although he does try that as well, right? Their simple pattern, whatever has to do with Leibowitz, we preserve it. We don't ask ourselves first, is this worth preserving? We just keep it going. Monasteries do have this habit sometimes. You just keep doing it the same way because we've forgotten what it, once we ask what's the right way to do it, we're gonna lose everything. <laughs> That sounds terrible, right? But he is showing that there's a kind, there's something weirdly beautiful about it, right? Which is this, right? That 
like that, that fidelity is easy to mock, this fidelity to tradition without understanding. But it shows this, we live not by like alternating between or, or just choosing adherence to observable scientific fact on the one hand or unwavering obedience to transcendent divine command, like two opposed things and we just have to choose. Rather, we are engaging at all times with a part of a story. Like monasteries, the image of a monastery enforces that the individual monk knows he is only part of the history of this institution. So we are holding on to the human desire to live and to hand on true life, right? Not the need right now to get everything just right, but the need to keep going. So what Miller is at pains to show is not that, that human civilization, I think, is fragile or futile. Well, it is. We've, that's been in the news a lot, right? It's, even President Biden spoke, I think, of the fragility of democracy, right, in his inaugural address. But that's, of course, true. But the other side of it, right, it's not, it's not just that humans are always sinking into ignorance or reaching to annihilation, but that human life has a durability as well. Like monks are amazingly hard to get rid of. The French Revolution closed down all the thousand monasteries in France, and yet now they're back. There's just no way to eradicate it. Sort of like cockroaches, some people say, right? Um, or like oak trees, to be more positive. They're just sort of impossible. Human life endures, but the problem is it endures as something weird. <laughs> Like things carry on, but become strange. I think that's what he is wanting to do. So his trans-historical portrait of the Albertian order of St. Leibowitz, as he calls it, as this kind of radical, almost absurd, not, not totally absurd, but almost absurd devotion to preservation, right? A specific kind of conservatism, right? conservationism really. Uh, this is to exemplify, as monks do in their own weird way, this sort of clinging to life, right? The great conflicts in the novel, as you read through, are about whether, it's it really whether to give up life or not, right? It's not just, will science work or not? So in the first part, there's a lot of like multi-headed mutants because of radiation. And there's a debate in society whether they should be recognized as human or not, right? And it's no surprise, the church and the monks come down on the side. They're born of human parents. They seem like monsters, but we will treat them as created in the image of God. Those are human, right? Even though they are grotesque and we can't really teach them, right? We don't want to give up on them, which seems crazy. Then, uh, later on, there's a similar question, right, which is uh, after the next nuclear holocaust, in the third part of the novel, everyone is dying of horrifying radiation poisoning, and the government sets up a legal means to achieve euthanasia, a mercy camp where you can get a certificate from a doctor that allows you to be peacefully executed, as it were, right, to die in peace and rather than suffer an incurable disease. And this leads to a conflict because the camp is across the street from the monastery, two, two miles down the road. So the abbot is protesting. There's a lot of confusion about what to really do, but he insists that we must instead face the challenge, right, of suffering. And he himself ends up doing that. And then maybe last of all, at the end of the novel, when the monks are leaving to go to outer space, I mean, how easy it would have been, how easy it would be at any point to just say, you know what, we quit, <laughs> we, we give up. The human race will simply continue destroying itself. But instead, what have they done? Over a millennium and a half, this order has trained itself to just keep going. Even if, like not to stop and say, is it worth going on? but simply say, this is impossibly difficult, but I'm gonna keep going, right? I don't think that's meant to be a sign of foolishness, right? But a sign of hope that they have been training themselves to carry on in the faith that even this disastrous human race, human culture 
has the potential for adding up to real meaning. It may not add up to human, natural, created perfection, right? But a kind of, of, uh, of mysterious perfection. And that I think is where the novel ends in many ways. So the, there's this question about paradise and Eden. Will we manage to attain immortality, complete control over our passions, perfect knowledge, right? Will, will human culture lead us there? Not really, but that doesn't mean we're not headed somewhere strangely beautiful. And this is what has played out in the last scene of the novel. So there's this character named um, Mrs. Grails. This is, this is one of the weirdest things I think I've ever really read and continued to turn back to. Mrs. Grails, who, who calls herself a tomato woman, she can't quite, she doesn't speak standard English. She pesters the abbot over and over again. The problem she's got is that she is a nuclear mutant. She's got a second head growing on one shoulder. She claims it's her daughter. She names it Rachel, and she is pestering to have it baptized. The parish priest won't do it, and the abbot says, I can't tread on his authority. But then as the end approaches, this becomes central, this weird outgrowth. It's grotesque and creepy, but it starts to become a character. Brother, J uh, uh, I guess Brother Joshua has this dream in which the head opens its eyes and tells him, I am the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> it's born out of the radiation in her body, right? like this new Madonna of Lourdes, very strange. And then as the actual apocalypse is happening and the monastery is destroyed by a shockwave, the abbot has heard Mrs. Grail's confession. He has absolved her and then she dies. He is himself half crushed and dying and he engages in an interchange with Rachel who can only repeat words. He tries to baptize her, but she refuses and he recognizes she actually doesn't need baptism. She's free. She's free from original sin. She's actually immaculate. He has dropped the ciborium full of consecrated Eucharistic hosts on the ground, and she picks it up and gives it to him. She has become this channel of grace, even though she is this nuclear mutant. <laughs> so man survives in a perfected form with a kind of of innocence, but as a, a two-headed <laughs> mutant, that's the new Eve, right? This is the new paradise, so kind of the, the desert blossoming, but it's grot a grotesque Eden. There's innocence and beauty, he claims he sees in her eyes, right? She touches him as he dies, and she says to him, live. It's like the first word she kind of comes up with on her own, and he says she sees the mystery. She can't use words, but she sees the presence under the veil of history. It's a really weird moment. So I, th I think that the story then, uh, it's a very dramatic and, and a lot of, of conflict of, of uh, different you know, sort of policies and thoughts and of disaster, but it's a true comedy. I don't think the Miller is, I don't think Arth that, that Walter Miller is making a farce or like a pastiche of Zerke's faith at the end. His experience of innocence in Rachel, I don't think is a delusion. The whole effort of the Order of St. Leibowitz was to make way for that new life. It's like the monks were Mrs. Grail's body, and there's this new outgrowth that can come from them. It's not because they're brilliant. It's because they have preserved what it, just life itself. So there's this sort of new perfection, but it's a strange looking perfection. We can't expect it to be sort of clean and perfect. So there's a million things I, I, I don't want to, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I'll, I'll, monastic silence will now resume. Um, but it's a brilliant uh, novel full of uh, strange radical images. I think it, the monastic character of it is what I've tried to bring out rather than it's many other kinds of characters. So I'll, I'll gladly invite uh, a more a more intelligent, uh, <laughs> maybe more attentive reader's uh, insight from uh, from Katie Carl. So thank thank you all for listening.
Thank you, Father Greg. That was fantastic. Um, thank you for everything you've said. And um, which above all, I think reflects an expression of the virtue of hope. Um, and I think Miller's novel reflects this hope too. Although, as you say, the the hope in Miller is inflected toward the very long view, um, maybe toward the grotesque. Um, you know, in the work of preservation and it's not without its darknesses. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, and you've spoken to us as a monk and as a preserver of culture yourself. When I speak, I'm speaking as an editor and a writer of fiction. So I'm going to spend time paying attention to, you know, it, but Father Greg, you've given us uh, you know, a lot of the depth that Miller goes into and have really dug into uh, the thematic richness that's available in this novel. Um, and what I think I will do is spend some time talking about on the line level, how Miller gets the effects that he gets. Um, but first, before I do that, um, I wanna go back and locate the novel in relation to other literary movements and other things that are happening at this time. Um, you know, it the, the novel is interesting in a literary sense because it exists at the intersection of two, um, you know, in, interesting developments in the 1950s and 1960s in American literature. First, the um, golden age of, you know, cl what you consider classic science fiction, uh, Asimov and, you know, Heinlein and Clark. Um, the novel to me, when I read it, invites comparison both to um, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, which has this radical dependence on, you know, children at the end of the novel as, you know, this sort of renewed force, this renewed, um, you know, life that's different form from the humanity that we recognized in the past, but is going to carry forward uh, into the future. Um, you know, the ending there invites comparison. It also invites comparison to Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. And both of those novels were published in 1953. Both of those we might speculate, although I can't prove, um, maybe someone else can, that, um, you know, Miller may have been influenced by one or both of those. Actually, um, the way that he talks about the memorizers and the bookleggers, you know, invites a direct parallel to, to Bradbury. Um, and that, you know, Bradbury's novel takes place in a time that's parallel to the simplification in some ways where simpletons are praised and the reading of books is, you know, it is absolutely forbidden, um, you know, and, you know, meets with destruction by fire, uh, literal fire, um, you know. The term bookleggers seems to be of Miller's coinage, but we could as equally apply it to the exiles at the end of Bradbury's work. Um, you know, but Walker Percy in his essay about Canticle for Leibowitz says that um, you know, this novel isn't like any other science fiction novel of its time or maybe ever um, in that it intersects at um, it exists at the intersection of a sort of X axis that most science fiction is interested in, namely questions like, have you split the atom yet? What's the state of your agriculture and your jurisprudence? You know, what are these sort of human level political uh, things going on, um, scientific things going on? What's your state of human development? Um, may, maybe not so much interested in the relationships between people, although I would say, I would argue that both Bradbury and Miller are interested in those questions too. Um, it, you know, but you know, it most fiction lives on this horizontal level, and it's rare uh, to find a novel that's interested in the vertical dimension of human existence. Um, Leibowitz is deeply interested both in the x-axis and in the y-axis, Percy says. And um, you know, he identifies the y-axis as Judeo-Christian, which is interesting because Miller is a Jewish convert to Catholicism um, you know, and the, you know, the symbolism of you know, the Jewish religious life comes in quite a bit, especially in the third part of the novel, um, you know, but from the beginning with it as well with um, the relationship to Leibowitz as a Jewish figure who, you know, in the novel's imaginarium has converted to Christianity. Um, and so that is maybe what makes it stand out from all the other science fiction that's happening at its time. Um, it also stands out because of its strange interest in the science fictional and it's having risen out of this sort of pulpy, you know, I guess you would call low culture, um, 
reality of the science fiction short fiction magazines that are common at the time and that are sort of looked down on as penny dreadfuls at the time, but you know that now we look back on as this sort of something worth preserving precisely, um, which is interesting uh, in itself. Anyway, um, to turn from that to um, questions of what makes something worth preserving, what we're doing when we're preserving culture. Um, you know, I would like to hope that um, the demise of culture in our time has been greatly exaggerated um, and that there's still hope to preserve you know, what good there is in our culture, despite the, um, you know, sort of for years now, the cultural water we swim in has been heated by this worry that the ascendancy of the internet, the rise of pop culture, the decline of print media are working together to usher us into some kind of new dark age. I would like to hope, um, you know, that even though I think Christian artist Makoto Fujimura is right in his recent book, Culture Care, when he uh, talks about the metaphorical water upstream of which, you know, the upstream of culture in the contemporary world is polluted and needs to be filtered of toxins, maybe even if not exercised of the demon fallout. Um, but I would like to hope that you know, the durability of human culture, as Father Stephen identified it, um, can last through cataclysm and hardship, um, even if what survives, survives precisely as weird. Um, so sometimes the farther away from something we are, the stranger it seems to us. Sometimes the converse is true and things seem stranger from close up. Uh, the prophet, as Flannery O'Connor writes, is a realist of distances. Uh, the novelist has to be a realist of temporalities. And Miller has the distinction of being both kinds of realist. Uh, a lot more could be said about how Miller uses and renders a sense of passing time in his novel. Uh, but one thing that I think is wonderful about how he does it is precisely that he brings in the monastic rule as a, a means of marking and measuring time uh, and is making us feel the passage of time as readers um, and giving us, uh, a, you know, taking us up that vertical axis and allowing us to have a historical view of the events of the novel in such a way that not only it's daily dimensions, but it's, um, it, you know, it, it's much larger timeline. Uh, it is, is tangible and vital to us. Um, you know, Miller gets a lot of comic and ironic mileage out of um, you know, the fact that we have a historical view that the characters in the story largely lack. Namely, we have the view of you know, the 20th century of knowing what happened, you know, what did happen and what didn't happen. So in, in one sense, we have this alternative history. Um, you know, in another sense, we have this, um, we have the scientific knowledge that the characters don't so that we can fill in what's going on um, in the background. Um, I'm interested in how he makes that work um, in the face of their environmental and sociological dystopia. Um, he uses the repetition and rhythm uh, as a beacon of reassurance that grace is not absent from the desert, that he's taking us somewhere worth being in all of this. Um, it's how he enacts uh, the virtue of hope in a in a fictional imaginarium. So, no matter how bleak or distorted the view, no matter how deep the suffering of the characters. So, um, I think he also uh, there's one more way that I want to talk about how he uses religious symbolism in particular, and it's not always necessarily the symbolism of the monastic life. In fact, there are two instances where a physical object, namely the rosary, stands in for the entirety of Catholic belief, um, not just monastic practice and belief, but Catholic practice and belief writ large. And he does this twice, and the way that he does it is so interesting to me. So the, um, uh, he, uh, on the very first pages of the novel, Francis Gerard, um, who we know almost instantly is not the brightest quill in the monastic scriptorium, is um, just doing his best not to get eaten by what he thinks is a cannibal. <laughs> um, you know, and he holds up his rosary beads like they're going to defend him. And he says, do you understand these? Uh, do you understand these? I think Walker Percy is like Geiger counters going off 
all over the place because of you know, the semiotic value of, of this sign, you know, the things that it should be representing to the reader, the things that if he does in fact understand it, it will be representing to the pilgrim. Um, you know, it's representing peace, it's representing, um, you know, that the, the person carrying them is not doing harm. Uh, and then we find out that to the pilgrim, they're also representing this, you know, well-known, I think it's interesting how even across these, you know, vast expanses of time, Miller has this consistency precisely of belief, um, you know, that everything that's born should be allowed to live. Um, everything that's conceived should be allowed to, to live until natural death, right? Um, you know, and that that's what's at issue in both of these instances. Anyway, to jump back to the first one, um, you know, they signify to the pilgrim this belief and his reaction is both telling and amusing. He goes, oh, you're one of those. <laughs> you know, so the rosary works is this shorthand um, and the, you know, the reliability of its signification um, is what enables Francis Gerard to live. And it's what enables to locate ourselves in, um, you know, in, in this backdrop, um, as Father Stephen talked about, this, um, you know, reliable backdrop of meaning. Um, you know, and against this reliable backdrop of meaning that's represented by the monastery, that's represented by Catholic belief, you know, this repetitive human drama of the phoenix, um, right? The fall, the destruction of culture, the preservation of the remnants, and then the, you know, eventual spiritual redemption, and then the beginning of the cycle all over again, this drama can play out. Um, so the rosary beads appear again on page 307 and they appear again as a sign of peace um, and as an affirmation of life. Um, when Miller um, has Zerke trying to convince the young woman whose child, you know, who along with her child is dying of radiation sickness, you know, not to visit the euthanasia clinic, um, you know, rather than break us out of the intense emotional reality of that moment rather than take us back and try to dogmatically explain why praying the rosary should be helpful you know about he doesn't try to explain the doctrine of offering up suffering you know to complete what's lacking in the sufferings of christ he just has the object on the page functioning as a symbol um representing um and he his question, Father Zerke's question to the young woman, I think it's so interesting how it echoes um, Fra Francis Gerard's question early on, um, do you understand these? He, he holds out the rosary to the young woman and he says, you know what this is. Um, and she says, certainly father. She, she knows, she understands. Um, but I think the way in which that scene ends invites us to ask ourselves, you know, how completely does she understand? She, she understands, but does she, you know, is it going to be, is her understanding going to be enough to support the action of her will in incredibly difficult circumstances? Is it going to be enough to enable her to live out this hard teaching? Um, you know, and is it, Ha has it retained or has it lost as a symbol its referent for her, in other words? And to what degree has, you know, some religious symbolism, at least in our time, lost its referent for some of Miller's readers, um, it may be for some of us, maybe for um, the culture at large, you know, and then that raises the larger question um, that I think Miller has been exploring through um, the changes and fluctuations in people's ability to understand scientific reference and symbols throughout the novel, um, namely what happens when you have symbols that have lost their reference. Um, you can't act on the knowledge, right? Um, you know, just to, we asked if Father Stephen raised the question earlier on, um, you know, the novel's question is not just what would it be like to to live in a dystopia, but what would it be like, um, you know, how do we get into a dystopia? How can we stay out of one? I think one of the things that Miller may be wanting to say here is that a dystopia is precisely what happens when symbols have lost their reference um, and when we can no longer act on the knowledge that we once had. Um, or we can no longer act beneficially on it um, when we act harmfully on it. Um, so 
I think um, he's offering us, however, a remedy. And I think he's offering a remedy, not necessarily in the sense of an easy answer, but of some tough knowledge that he'd like us to have. Um, and he's raising questions as much as he's giving answers. But I think um, some of the things he's offering us explicitly or implicitly are precisely these characteristic habits of the Catholic imagination, these you know, symbols that retain their reference that enable us to act helpfully rather than harmfully. Um, and these habits that include thinking in centuries, thinking with a historical perspective, taking the long view, um, balancing the historical with the individual, resisting fear, it's huge. Um, to the ability to identify and oppose moral wrong, not through mob mentality or emotivism, but through clear reasoning and spiritual discernment. Um, and he's asking us to, to do all this, um, you know, even when it looks difficult or impossible. He's inviting us to locate hope, um, not necessarily in the natural or even the preternatural, but um, precisely in the territory, the strange middle ground where nature meets grace and the results begin to look uncanny. Um, just to conclude, Catholic editor and novelist Caroline Gordon working around the same time as Miller. This letter is in 1958 that I'm about to quote from Miller's publishing in 1959. Um, Gordon writes to Flannery O'Connor, her protege, um, there's only one plot, the scheme of redemption. All other plots, if they are any good, are splinters off this basic plot. Um, Gordon also tells O'Connor that the end of his story should achieve alt altitude, um, a similar, a closely attain to something approaching a divine perspective on human events. Um, certainly what Miller is up to in his conclusion fulfills and more than fulfills uh, Gordon's two demands for redemption and for altitude. Um, despite the wholesale destruction that the pilgrim church on earth leaves behind it when it leaves earth to become a pilgrim church among the stars. Um, you know, but I think Miller wants to draw our attention not only to that departure, but also to, um, you know, the suffering that's implied um, in that moment when, you know, Earth is being left behind. You know, when he has Pope Gregory in the novel stop praying for peace on Earth, I think that moment gives us chills and it should because it's a tacit acknowledgement that in the storyline as Miller has cast it, um, you know, the prayer for justice has become you know, a lost cause, or, or sorry, the prayer for peace has become a lost cause. The prayer for justice is all that's left. Um, you know, and Miller is inviting us to try to avoid this kind of situation where, you know, peace is a lost cause and justice is all that's left. Um, you know, and I think the fabulated nature of that moment shouldn't invite us to keep it at the margins of our attention the way that, you know, for much of the novel, the nuclear apocalypse is at the margins of attention. Um, you know, it should cause us to reflect and ask ourselves, what are we doing now to lead toward or away from a moment where peace becomes impossible and only justice remains, where symbols have lost their reference and we can't act helpfully on them anymore. Um, I think Miller would be happy to see us take the direction that he has Brother Joshua take at the end. Um, and I'll, so I'll end with Brother Joshua's prayer. Uh, speak up destiny, speak up. Destiny always seems decades away, but suddenly it's not decades away. It's right now, but maybe destiny is always right now, right here, right this very instant, maybe. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over for Q and A. Well, that was excellent. These reflections were great. It was, you know, fantastic one-two punch, masterly reflections. Both, uh, I really uh, am grateful to you both for your for your thought and your time to um, uh, to kind of assemble your thoughts. And deliver them so beautifully. You know, just a couple of thoughts from me, then I want to get to these uh, observations and questions from our community here. Uh, it is wonderful to hear Flannery O'Connor's name invoked uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, certainly the Caroline Gordon uh, relationship is very important, and that's a great letter. Uh, but, you know, I think that Miller is reading O'Connor too. Uh, a Temple of the Holy Ghost came out, I think, 55 or 57. 
And that the, the hermaphrodite character in that in that short story is kind of the same treatment as the Grail's Rachel character, you know. And you can see this, you know, uh, God made me this way, and I don't dispute it, right? That kind of thing. And, and the grace is filled, and that character becomes such a conduit of grace. Um, there's something about the logos, Katie. You're talking about you too, Father Greg, but the uh, Miller has meditations on logos throughout the novel. So cultures come and go, they die, they, they corrode, they erode, they're, they're corrupt, they're, they're uh, beautiful, they're all these things, but the logos inscribed in nature remains and the logos, the living logos of love and in, in God. But later Miller says that the reason is never going to be as strong as love. In his later life, he says that, I mean, he's, you know, he's, he had a kind of a peculiar relationship with, with Catholicism and he has this kind of love and, and reason, uh, you know, uh, tension that we all have. Uh, so that's great. One, one read or comment, then I'll give you guys a question and we can move. Uh, here's one from, from Fritz Heinzen, just a, a meditation. He taught, Fritz taught at, at the University of Notre Dame. And he said he used to teach canticle with his students in his freshman international relations class. He says the best book I ever used uh, with students uh, in the classroom. It got them to think about so many different issues related to international relations. Uh, and was a welcome change of pace from all the usual factual material. Uh, would recommend it to anyone else who's doing this, not just international relations. I mean, I put a novel in every class. I don't care what it is. Uh, and that's, that's a core curriculum. Uh, so that's just a text without comment. Let me, add, let me give you this one here from Colleen Trevis. I believe it's Colleen Trevis. It is Colleen. And Father Stephen, she, she writes, asks, uh, or sorry, talks about uh, wondering if we are reaching a dark age here and now, would the rise of fake news and questioning of truth be ways in which we are moving into a dark age? How can we resist this pull? What do you think, Father Greg? That's a, that's a challenging question. I, um, people are very worried about questioning truth. And what you see in the novel, the monks are trained in many ways not to question, right? So if you think of um, a sort of a critical moment, Francis Jared is there in the fallout shelter. He sees the sign that says inner hatch, you know, like, and he thinks there's a fallout monster in there, but he's trained himself not even to think about opening it. He won't even look at the skull. So there's a, you know, the, the novel is, it, there's sort of a, I don't know, like a, it looks like a flight from truth, right? It's based on the medieval tradition that curiosity is actually a very sinful and dangerous habit to have, right? Because it means you're always getting into other people's business. What the, the novel wants to show is that this attitude of like non-inquisitiveness is actually what enables these people to recognize what the truth really is. The truth is not something you can just look up, right? So I, mean, I, I think like a notion like fake news or the, the undermining of like the nature of truth in our own, even like the meaning of words, right? In our own common discourse. So people often think of like, like Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland, you know, like the word means whatever I, I'm gonna say, whatever I say, it claim it means. And that of course can like ruin, you know, one of the foundations of civil society, which is our ability to com communicate rationally <laughs> with each other. On the other hand, the truth has never been something easy, <laughs> right? I mean, um, it's not, you know, truth is not just two plus two even equals four. I mean, even mathematical truth is more complicated than that, right? Um, so I, I like whether we're in a dark age or not, I don't know. My, my own life is, is very stable and secure for now. Um, but we're also, I mean, I, I, don't, I think many people are, are ready for hard times. I mean, we, we underestimate the strength people have, you know. Um, uh, and even now, I mean, when we look at the, the Dark Ages, there's an interesting book that just came out um, maybe at the end of 2020 called The Light Ages, sort of rereads medieval and, and Renaissance science to look at how many things they actually understood. I mean, but if, if we're going to tell ourselves that 
if we don't understand absolutely everything and have every single person agree about the nature of things, then we're not, then we're in a dark age, then we're, we're that that's a foolish way to approach it. So um, yeah. I, mean, I think it's, I suggested what I was saying that the notion of an information age to me sounds very medieval. They have yeah. lots of information, um, but not a lot of, you know, like what makes someone like Thomas Aquinas important is that he can organize it. Right. Oh, that's I good. Like we might be really on the verge of a, of a really brighter kind of organization. I don't know. Right. You know, there's something interesting because like uh, I have my my uh, novel from 1988 when I first read it, you know, this Katie, this pulp, <laughs> this pulp uh, Bantam book paperback. But on, on 259, uh, I think it's Zerky says, you know, because the bombing has happened and he's he wants to get the news. And he's, where's the truth? Asked the abbot. Yeah. Uh, so we have all that that kind of you know complicated. Who do we believe? You know, uh, Hannigan the second. Any thoughts, Katie? I think it's a really good question. I think um, you know it's interesting. There is a a line here where they are looking at an account, um, a, a post flame deluge account of what took place during the flame deluge, and it's interesting because it touches on how we come to understand uh, both current events and history. Um, one of the monks who's responding to this very scripturalized account uh, is saying, um, you know, we don't know how reliable this is. Um, you know, from, from what I've been able to glean from looking at a number of sources, he's implying, um, he says something like, there was too much going on all at once for any one observer to get the mm -hmm. whole picture. Um, and so I think any kind of response to, um, you know, the rise of fake news, misinformation has to rely in part on a multiplicity of perspectives on, you know, trying to get, you know, accurate and reliable observations from a number of quarters and put things together um, it precisely to act as, you know, to the degree that we're able integrators. Um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, that line jumped out at me because it mm. was um, you know, very similar to a text that someone in my family sent me, um, you know, during, after the Capitol was stormed, they said, um, there's so much happening all at once. I can't find mm. any one source that's integrating all of the, uh -huh. you know, the news that's coming out of just this one event. Um, you know, so I think it behoves us to keep our eyes open, pay attention, um, not look necessarily to any one um, source, but to be aware um, of multiple perspectives and to understand why people see things the way they do and why they're thinking the way they are. I think that's fairly put, and I, I agree. There is something about the simplification in the novel mm -hmm. and some of these other spurious sources, you know, say QAnon type things, where you, uh, it's not like, not like no nothingism. There's one, one thing mm -hmm. that, it's one thing to be simple. There's another thing to traffic and lies. So those are those are categorically different. But I think you know, uh, boy, we could say something that's it's one twelve. We have about three four minutes. Uh, we know that we can go on a long time here. I know Father Greg teaches this novel. Others do on the thread as well. I want to read one comment and then uh, read another question and hopefully get to that and see where we are. Uh, John Neff writes this very simple, but I think very profound. Does not humor. He writes. Uh, at the complete misunderstanding we have about one another, hold these three novellas together. Quick thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, for my part, that, that's what I, I was hoping to point out, right? That the humor of the novel is not meant to be cynical, but to show that, it, like to bring out sort of the beauty of what's going on. Kind of like when, um, I don't know, I, I have two nieces uh, my brother has two daughters, uh, teenagers, and I, I sort of see them going about their activities and reacting to what's going on in their lives. And I can see, well, on the one hand, they're doing a better job than I did. And it's, but it's fun for me to see, like, they don't understand what that looks like for me, for us who are from a, of a different generation and so on. There's a kind of, of, you know, they may be frustrated in getting things wrong. And we sort of, enjoy it in a comic way we don't want them to be wrong but there's a, there it increases our love for them that that we can maintain our communion with them even when 
they say they're going to hate us forever or whatever, right? <laughs> um, so there's a kind of the the foolishness of the monks is 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 charming, right? Yeah. And I think one one maybe one last thought about it is like one of the ways that that happens in the in the novel for for the for the most charming characters. I, I think Francis Jared at the beginning and and Joshua in his way at the end, like there's a charming interest. Um, they uh, they're so unprepossessed, like they 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 don't have high expectations of themselves they're so humble right they're not hiding anything and that's the childlike quality that makes the humor seem to actually uplift them rather than cut them down it's very light and it's very it's very edifying uh inhumane katie do you have a thought on the humor i do i think um you know miller is yeah, not inviting us to have a laugh at the character's expense um you know even when there is sort of a slapstick quality <laughs> <laughs> you know, as in some instances there is. Um, he, I think he's inviting us to two things. I think he's inviting us to a healthy skepticism about our own conviction that we have the full picture, that we know everything. Um, you know, he's inviting us to suspend judgment in a certain sense. He's also inviting us to, I think, a little bit of self-compassion um, you know, about this inability to fully understand everything. Uh, he's saying that that's just human nature and to expect that of yourself would be, you know, to expect more than, you know, to be expect yourself to be God. And that's where we get into trouble when we try to make human beings yeah. Wonderful, you know, and there's that it's, it's the wood carving. I forget, it's that the the grin of Le, as a Leibowitz. I mean, it's all it's always like a, a mirthful grin on there, and it makes me think of you know Chesterton at the end of Orthodoxy uh, that the great secret of Jesus was his mirth, you know, <laughs> um, which is wonderful. Um, so you know, uh, let me just say uh, one more kind of this is a, a this is for Father Greg. Uh, and it's from Ron, um, let's see, Ron uh, Nazar. And he, he says, this is, refers to Alistair McIntyre, um, such a leading figure in moral philosophy. Uh, and McIntyre reads Leibowitz. And he, do you, do you know why Alistair McIntyre thinks the canticle is so central to explaining our present condition of disconnection with the past? His fo and McIntyre's focus on reclaiming neo-Aristotelian Thomism. Now that's definitely a $10 question, but uh, I think it's important to kind of be finished on. Uh, so Father Greg, a thought on that? Yeah, it is interesting that McIntyre sort of begins and ends uh, after virtue with this image, the image of, of uh, the Leibowitzian images. Um, why, why exactly he picks that? So my, my first response is, you know, this, this is the clearest popular fictional vision of what happened with St. Benedict and, and figures like Cassiodorus in the early Middle Ages, the late end of the Roman Empire, people who consciously removed themselves from the mainstream of Roman society, in Cassiodorus's case, almost merely for the sake of preserving what there was left, right? for Benedict for striving for holiness and for being in God's eyes and all that. So uh, if, if we want to imagine what those earlier moves at the end of the antique world were like, this novel is the closest in a way. Um, now, one question to me, I mean, so it reminds me also sort of similarly of the, the sort of a very very popular book called The Benedict Option, right? Well, just, yeah, perfect. Right? So yeah. Sort of, which is not just about McIntyre's questions, but sort of sort of cultural societal questions. Like we need to step back and found like a new vision of a small community, like a sort of anti, I mean, sort of anti-global, you know, like uh, maybe that's an important factor. Now, what, what, you know, in Benedict's case, the actual St. Benedict, like they end up preserving classical culture you know, in, in McIntyre's vision, like it's a specific sort of, you know, the perennial philosophy of the church that sort of after hundreds of years been filtered into a clear vision of the nature of things that, that needs to be kind of kept and, mm. and made a foundation. So I don't know, last thought about it is like, you know, the real hope is that not that we're going to just conquer the world, and everything's going to be perfect, <laughs> but that those who retreat and protect what is precious like protect something that really is capable of from, we know it's capable of bearing fruit. Right. 
it's not just random junk, but finding that thing and doing it as a community rather than just as a lunatic. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Father Greg. That's very well said. We appreciate those insights. Katie, do you have one last thing to say? Yeah, I'd just like to jump on to that to add that um, the work of preservation, even when it doesn't seem like it's worth doing, when it seems when you're in the weeds and you're, you know, looking at spreading all this blue ink around and you're thinking, why am I doing this insane thing, right? Um, you know, every little detail of these uh, vocations to preservation has its purpose and has its importance, um, it, you know, and not to lose sight of that when in the weeds, but to hold on to it and, and to, to see that as a bigger picture. Thank you. You know, I think I'll take director's privilege here and make one observation because of that you cited the uh, the Benedict option, Father Greg. And I was thinking a lot about that in our in our preparation about that concept. And uh, it's an embattled concept. It might be uh, misunderstood by many. Who knows? But I know I, we, this is Loyola, and we have the Ignatian option. And I think of Father Pedro Arupe in in a suburb of Hiroshima in 1945. And I, when I when I when I read uh, Abbot Zerke, and Father Rupe was there when the bomb was dropped in '45. Father Rupe had four years of medical school under his belt and a doctorate in medical ethics, and they set a hospital up at the. Uh, he was the master of novices just outside of Hiroshima, and they they tended to over 200 people. And I could not get that image of Father Rupe out of my mind, and it was a blessed image, uh, but I just want to leave. Uh, you know, th that was a very that, that was a grounding for me. Of a Leibowitzian, uh, of just the 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 vision of Miller, and the absolute relevance. And I know a lot of folks on this thread here might be a little older than, than I, older than Father Greg, older than Katie, and who lived in lived these things, and who were doing who were going under the desk in the fifties for these these a bomb scares. And I know this hits you close to home. So I think uh, it's a masterly job. And let's put our hands together for Father Stephen, Greg, and Katie, Carl. Please join us and have a wonderful day. Blessings to all. And the Cistercians. Thank you. God bless us. Yeah. God bless. <laughs>